Good evening and welcome to Visions. I'm Megan Searle and our guests this evening are Kurt Esser and Jesse Taylor from the Justice Project. Welcome back to the program. Thank you very Thank much. You. Now we're here to talk about the Migration Amendment Bill. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's an interesting piece of legislation. It's the first time really that the government's legislative program has uh, had a, an important setback. The government was responding to the fact that temporary protection visas had been granted to 43 West, Asi West Parkland asylum seekers. Yes. And it seemed with indecent haste that the government's response to that was to attempt to uh, engineer a number of changes to the Migration Act, which would have seen people coming to Australia by boat, no matter where they arrived, all being processed offshore. It's oh, incredible. That was the major part of the intended amendments, that all processing would happen offshore. But allied to that major thrust would have been the notion that people would have been unable to gain access to Australia, even if those persons were found to be persons to whom the Commonwealth owed the obligation of protection under the Refugee Convention. Yes. If those amendments had passed, we would have seen a wholesale scaling back of our obligations under the Refugee Convention, which has been part of domestic Australian law since 1951. So it was just as well that that, um, that comprehensive kind of um, change to our whole international perspective, so far as refugees was concerned, was rebuffed. Um, at the moment we're in a bit of a twilight zone, and I think we're probably going to speak about that later. Yes. But the most important aspects of the um, amendments that so far haven't got through would have seen um, no access to Australian courts by people whose applications would have been refused. Uh, yeah, I can remember seen, us talking about that in previous yeah, episodes. Yeah. There would have been lack of supervision by the Ombudsman. There would have been a raft of changes that confronted all the recommendations made by the Comrie Report, the Ombudsman's Report, and the Palmer Report, which we've seen in the last couple of years. And um, it would have really put us on a collision course with um, all our obligations. The other important thing is, of course, that it represented a quite unacceptable, we thought, um, response to the, sen the sensitivities that the government of Indonesia had about our offering of um, permanent pro or temporary protection visas to 43 partners. Yes, yes. So, um, for all sorts of reasons, it, it was a line drawn in the sand. Yes. And um, happily for the time being, it's been reconsidered. Lovely. We like to reconsider. Now, we're calling it the Migration Amendment Bill. What is its actual title? It's called the Migration Amendment brackets, designated unauthorised arrivals, close brackets, bill. Lovely. Um, not quite so friendly like that. It's not that, that catchy. It? No, no. <laughs> um, and what it would have meant in practical effect, I mean, Kurt's just given us a good overview of what the legal sort of um, legal implications of it are. But in practical terms, it would have meant that someone who's fleeing persecution, maybe from, from Iraq or from Afghanistan or from uh, perhaps an African country, would have perhaps made it to Indonesia and got on a boat to come to Australia. Now, it is, as I've said, I don't know how many times now on this program, um, it's not actually illegal for people to come uh, to Australia by boat without papers and passports and documents and things to seek asylum. Yes. But what would have happened to those people, what would happen to those people if in fact this bill ever does pass, um, would be that once they arrive on Australia, on an island belonging to Australia, on Ashmore Reef or on the Australian mainland, it would mean that they would be moved post-haste off to Christmas Island or Nauru, which is, of course, not a part of Australia, mm. for their applications to be processed. And they'll sort of be left there um, for quite a long time. I mean, you know, there are some people on, on Nauru now who have been there for around about five years, I think, um, who ha have just been kind of left in a black hole. And they will be processed on Nauru, but not processed to come to Australia, as Kurt said. If, you know, even if they're found to be refugees in every possible you know, yes. sense of the word, we, Australia will not accept them. We'll l leave them there until we can convince some other country to take them. So in terms of us accepting refugees at all, mm -hmm. will we? Can we? If, that's if, the bill? if those amendments had passed, yeah. we would have seen all unauthorised arrivals arriving by sea, no yeah. matter where they arrived. Mm. I mean, as Jess said, if they arrived sort of on Ashmore Reef, but it's, it's more grotesque than that. I'm actually sorry, they, I'm thinking, how else do refugees arrive in Australia? Well, very often they do uh, arrive that way because 
they just they're forced by circumstances mm. to flee in whatever way yes, they can. Absolutely. And, um, very often, leaky boats are the only alternative. Yeah. There are other ways that people arrive as refugees, though. Mm. Australia is a party. Um, to the United Nations Offshore Resettlement Program. So when there are people um, in, in refugee, refugee camps, camps in the Middle East or in Africa or in yeah. you know, various parts of perhaps Eastern Europe and places like that, um, Australia agrees to take 13,000 of those, those people designated by the UN right. um, as it's what we call the offshore okay. um, resettlement program. And actually Australia's record with the offshore program is quite quite good. Like, you know, 13,000 is a decent number, yes. even though there are a number of million people of concern to the UN. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's the main other way. The, the other way that people do it fairly often in Australia is by coming here on a... Um, on a tourist visa or a student visa or yeah. just on a visiting But then you're visa. assuming people have got enough money to be able to... To do that. ...get on a plane and... Yeah. But often people arrive on, on, you know, valid passport, valid visa and all of that kind okay. of thing, yeah. and they apply for refugee status like that. Yeah. But if they don't apply for refugee status within 45 days, then that's when Bridging Visa E kicks in, which yeah. we've talked about before, yes, which is do. the visa with no work rights, yeah. no access to Centrelink and no access to Medicare, which, of course, has a whole raft mm. of other problems. It's oh, so complicated, isn't it? It is a bit of a minefield. It's complicated <laughs> for us here. Imagine what it's like for people who yeah. are trying to get asylum. Who struggle with English mm. and who haven't been to school. And yeah, yeah exactly. It's not a user-friendly system. No. What I was going to say is, is that if those amendments had passed, we would have seen yeah. people arriving, no matter where they'd arrived. They could have arrived in Tasmania by boat. Yeah. Sydney Harbour. They, 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 <laughs> they would have been shipped off to yeah. Nara, places like no. Nauru to be processed. And it would have been like our own Guantanamo Bay. Yes. Australia conducting a Guantanamo Bay offshore, out of sight, um, with no kind of um, mechanism by which uh, people could seek redress or people could have their cases mm. reviewed. And no real control over the way that detention is administered either. Yes. Because um, Nauru is its own sovereign country. I mean, we, have, we, we ought not to have control over its domestic laws as no other country ought to have control over our domestic laws. Absolutely. So what we're doing is we're paying Nauru in this kind of strange strange relationship to warehouse these people to sort of take them off our hands. But in reality, um, we can't actually look after the way that those people who are our responsibility are treated. Exactly. We, we have no way of dictating that, which is really of concern, particularly because um, Nauru isn't a signatory to the Refugees Convention. So they have no protection mandate, they have no mandate whatsoever exactly. to look after refugees or to look after people who are in that situation of vulnerability. Going to have to stop you there. No worries. You're watching Visions. We'll be back shortly.